The period of 1861 to 1865 proved a tumultuous time in the history of the United States. After a bloody civil war, the nation finally exhibited some semblance of peace, as on April 9, 1865, the Army of Northern Virginia, under the command of General Robert E. Lee, surrendered to the Grand Army of the Republic under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. This struggle pitted father against son, cousin against cousin, and friend against friend. With the war finally over, the nation could begin healing. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, led the nation and became known as the Great Emancipator. He determined a course to reunite the two warring factions back into one nation. But Lincoln's plans would not come to fruition as an assassin's bullet ended his vision on April 14, 1865. How could this happen to the nation's leader, a man who sought to bring together once sworn enemies being executed as though he were a condemned man? Prior to the assassination, one Confederate sympathizer enlisted the assistance of several others and planned, at first, to kidnap the president and hold him for ransom. But with the Confederacy's surrender, those plans changed to something more sinister and infamously everlasting throughout American history. When the American Civil War began, the North clearly held the advantage as they had undergone an industrial revolution of sorts in the early 19th century, utilizing technology for the building and maintenance of factories and foundries. The South, on the other hand, still relied on their agrarian means through slavery to maintain their economy, an institution throughout early American history that drew the criticism and condemnation of those that lived free and desired freedom for those who toiled in bondage. With the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in December of 1862, effective in January 1863, President Lincoln freed those slaves in bondage in the states who were at war with the Union. From that point forward, the war turned to the advantage of the North. That, and when Lincoln finally found a commander who could defeat General Robert E. Lee. In 1865, with the war finally at an end, President Lincoln determined that the South not be treated with animosity, but welcomed back into the Union as a lost family member that finally found their way home. Even with this type of intention, President Lincoln still stood in the eyes of die-hard Southerners to be the devil incarnate. Placing blame squarely on his shoulders for the defeat and decimation of the South, most Confederate sympathizers believed he sounded the death knell to any return of the South's previous economic prosperity, and doomed its citizens to the condition of servitude once forced on the slaves of the region. One man in particular, the descendant of one of the greatest actors in American history, sympathized with the Southern cause, being a Virginian by birth and a stern defender of slavery. Junius Brutus Booth was one of the greatest actors of his time and he met his wife while in England and chose to leave his first wife in his homeland while setting sail for America in search of better acting roles. The problem was that the elder Booth never actually divorced his first wife before he married his second, Mary Ann Holmes. John Wilkes Booth was born the ninth child to an acting family under the patriarch of Junius Brutus Booth on May 10, 1838. Named by his grandfather at the behest of Booth's mother, Richard Booth chose the name John Wilkes Booth, a name they took from an ancestor who was also active in politics. Junius Brutus Booth often went on tour with acting companies, and when he did, the family stayed in a house in Baltimore, Maryland, a short distance away from the family home located in Bel Air, Maryland. Little Johnny's childhood was filled with the things that little boys enjoyed, but due to the successful career of his father, 
and the notoriety that accompanied the almost perfect performance in theaters throughout the country, the elder Booth found it possible to provide classical educations for all his children. Johnny was no exception. The future actor and assassin kept his mind busy reading the classics such as Milton, Livy, Plutarch, and Shakespeare, where he digested the factual tales of men who fought against tyranny. This seemed to have a great influence on the young Booth as he grew older and became embroiled in the issues of the day. In 1846, Junius Brutus Booth's first wife, Adelaide Delanoy Booth, discovered the second family of her estranged husband, even though the Booth family in America was not secret to anyone paying attention. Adelaide made her way to the United States in order to secure divorce from her bigamist husband and confronted the elder Booth in a very public way. Understandably, Adelaide suffered an unrecoverable embarrassment and she sought her pound of flesh. At every turn, the Booths ignored this woman until she flatly stated that the second family were all bastards, born out of wedlock and illegal in the eyes of any court as to succession. Adelaide wanted everyone to know that she was the one and only Mrs. Booth. This erupted as a scandal for the Booth family and it took a number of years for Junius to live it down. Since the first Mrs. Booth came to the United States and decided to expose Junius for the demeaning way he treated his first wife, John Wilkes remembered this humiliation throughout the rest of his life, defending his family's honor, or lack thereof, until his last days. He idolized his father and refused to believe, even with documentary evidence to the contrary, that every one of the Booth's children born of the Second Union were illegitimate. When John Wilkes turned 14 years old, Junius Brutus Booth died, making John Wilkes the man of the house. After leaving school, the young Booth returned to the family's farm and began seeing to the financial affairs of his father's estate. The task proved daunting for John Wilkes as the family never owned slaves to help with the labor, but occasionally rented them from their neighbors. The young Booth tried to help his mother and two sisters and even threw in his lot to try his hand at farming. One of the factors that is rarely mentioned is that Junius Booth helped some of the slaves he rented from neighbors buy their freedom. Because of where the Booth farm stood situated, the sectional differences between the North and the South stood out like a sore thumb, the starkest issue being that of slavery. This institution saw its zenith prior to the American Civil War, when a senator from New York, William H. Seward, sought to keep the heated debate alive as long as possible. In an effort to keep tacit approval for the peculiar institution, John Wilkes adopted the mantra of nativism to his state of Maryland rather than stipulating either a disdain or support for slavery. The Know Nothing Party, popular at this time, stood on the platform of anti-immigration and anti-Catholicism, believing that Catholics presented an idea of tyrannical rule. With many immigrants as worshipers of the faith, many nativists believed that the devout Catholics who made their way to the United States would infect the populace with unacceptable rule by a faraway church. John Wilkes firmly held the case and declared himself to be an advocate for keeping the status quo. In August of 1855, John Wilkes Booth made his acting debut at the Baltimore Charles Street Theater in a production of Richard III. The young actor began his career in the family tradition as his father and his brothers first debuted in the same play. John Wilkes played the Earl of Richmond, whom the character desires to overthrow Richard III for his tyrannical ways. Booth's stage career seemed to improve along with his acting, and more roles came to him over the next two years. By October 17, 1859, Booth played a series of roles when, one night, he received news of the John Brown raid at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Brown was hailed as a staunch abolitionist who became involved in several massacres around the Union where those who advocated slavery were slaughtered indiscriminately. Federal troops under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee captured Brown after a long standoff in the armory there. Brown hoped to start a slave insurrection with the raid on the armory where he and members of his family would steal weapons and arm the slaves throughout the South. The plan did not go as well as Brown hoped, 
and he was captured. Later that month, the U.S. government put Brown on trial for inciting a slave revolt with the governor of the state, Henry A. Wise, calling out the militia to make sure that the trial and possible execution went off without any difficulties. The staging area for one of the units called out to protect the jail, the Richmond Grays, was in the train station next to the theater where Booth was employed at the time. Due to some coaxing, Booth finagled a uniform from one of the militia members and went with them to see the execution of John Brown. At Charlestown, now located in West Virginia, Booth stood at the edge of the scaffold where John Brown would meet his demise. Booth recounted later that he felt impressed with Brown's convictions that he was strong enough to die for them. Booth later told his sister, Brown was a brave man. His heart must have broken when he felt himself deserted. Along with the raid on Harper's Ferry, the presidential election of 1860 proved contentious. Seward got pushed to the side and the new Republican Party nominated a young representative from the state of Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. The South let it be known that if Lincoln were elected to the office of the presidency, secession would follow, and that it did. Six southern states followed South Carolina out of the Union, thus beginning the American Civil War. In 1864, after a very trying time for the country as a whole, the South suffered some humiliating defeats after starting the conflict with promising victories. But the fact that more support of the war was demonstrated in the North, more so in the South, the conflict took a disastrous turn for the Confederates as Sherman's march to the sea and the later capture of Richmond, the Confederate capital, proved just too much for the war-weary South. At this time, Booth wanted to take part in some sort of action that could possibly save the South from an inevitable ruination. For the last year or so, Booth had been working with the Confederate underground, spying when he could and smuggling quinine to soldiers in the South. At this time, Booth met David Harold, a secessionist who worked as a clerk in a local store. Booth felt he could trust Harold with whatever plans he may hatch, should the need arise, in the future. Being as Booth worked as an actor, most of the time in occupied southern cities, he had a pass to move between the lines when the needs arose, signed by General Grant himself. Oftentimes, when staying at his sister Asia's house in Philadelphia, he slept on her couch and would meet with people in the middle of the night and discuss clandestine machinations. In 1864, it appeared that Booth became more fanatical about assisting the South with whatever means in order to ensure a victory or a square surrender deal, again, should the need arise. One of the issues that seemed to preoccupy the actor stemmed from the prisoners of war. Until earlier that year, prisoner exchanges were common, but General Grant ended the practice as most of the Confederates exchanged returned to the front to fight against the Union. General Grant believed that by ending the exchange, he deprived the South of much needed manpower to continue the war. This, ostensibly, hurt the South in preserving the continued military effort. In the South, where the Confederate government experienced difficulty in maintaining a sufficient food supply for their own citizens, rations for prisoners of war had to be cut. Thus, many of the exchanged soldiers returned to the North looking as though they were barely alive. The Union responded in kind under the orders of Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, who, on August 18, 1864, mandated that the rations for Confederate prisoners be cut in half as well. The exchange of Confederate prisoners and the conditions to which they endured seemed to weigh heavily on Booth, as one intimate friend stated about the actor, Booth seemed to have his heart set upon the relief and exchange of the Confederate prisoners. That was his plan and aim. Booth took the issue of prisoners of war personally, as an old school friend had been murdered by a guard at the old Capitol prison. Booth believed that the prisoner exchanges could be resumed if he could find leverage to commence the practice again. The actor devised a plan to kidnap President Lincoln and hold him for ransom, primarily to reenact the prisoner exchange. In August of 1864, Booth traveled to Baltimore to contact two acquaintances that he hoped would help with his plan. Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Laughlin Jr. listened to Booth's plan and agreed with the premise. 
The plan to kidnap President Lincoln was nothing new, as there were machinations of this type that came from the Confederate government itself for some time. The first plot to kidnap the President was thwarted during Confederate General Jubal Early's advance through Maryland, when another general, Bradley T. Johnson, was to grab the President while he visited the Soldiers' Home, a summer residence of the executive. But General Early changed the plans at the last minute and General Johnson was stopped outside of Washington, D.C. at Fort Stevens. A Confederate agent, Thomas Nelson Conrad, formulated a second plan in September of 1864, but with the presidential election of that year, Secretary of War Stanton stationed more guards to watch the president. Therefore, that plan had to be abandoned. Even though both of these plans never came to fruition, Booth's scheme followed the basic framework of the previous intentions. Booth planned to nab President Lincoln while the chief executive made his way to the soldier's home, secreting him across the Anacostia River into Charles County, an area very friendly to the Confederacy, then ferrying him across the Potomac, making their way to Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. Later in the month of September 1864, Booth thought the plot so feasible that he gave up acting and worked on the plan full time. In order for the plot to succeed, Booth felt compelled to notify Confederate officials to his plan in the hopes that perhaps they would provide additional assistance. Booth journeyed to Montreal, Canada to meet with officials from the Confederate Secret Service. After notifying the powers that be of his intentions, Booth returned to the United States. In November of that year, Lincoln won re-election. Booth stated that Lincoln should have never been elected president in the first place, and he saw President Lincoln's re-election as a step toward a dictatorship. On his way back into the U.S., Booth stopped at the residence of Dr. William Queen, a Southern sympathizer who organized a clandestine mail service for the Confederacy. And while there, Booth met Queen's son-in-law, Dr. John C. Thompson. Booth spent the night at Dr. Queen's residence, and early the next Sunday morning, they attended church together. Booth used the ruse that he had a great interest in real estate, allowing him to travel freely through the lines. Dr. Thompson introduced Booth to another man that desired to sell his farm, and Booth expressed a great interest. The man who wanted to sell his farm was Dr. Samuel Mudd, an important figure within the alleged conspiracy. Dr. Mudd invited Booth to inspect the property and then spent the night at the Mudd residence. On a trip to New York, Booth purchased various weapons, including, but not limited to, some Spencer rifles, knives, handcuffs, and leg irons. After procuring the essentials, Booth shipped the items to Baltimore and then they made their way to Washington, D.C. On his way back to Maryland, Booth again met with Dr. Mudd. While staying at the National Hotel, Dr. Mudd ran into Booth. Dr. Mudd later stated that, Booth was always forcing himself upon me. It was at this time that Dr. Mudd and Booth walked along 7th Street and met one John Surratt. Dr. Mudd made the introductions between Booth and Surratt. Both Surratt and his mother would play an integral part in Booth's plan. John Surratt worked as an agent of the Confederate government. Surratt's main function was to carry messages from Richmond to Montreal, where the Confederate Secret Service operated. His mother, Mary E. Surratt, ran a tavern considered as a safe house for Confederate agents passing through. Business at the house seemed slow, so Mrs. Surratt rented out the tavern and operated a boarding house within the city of Washington, D.C. on H Street. Booth subsequently met with John Surratt to discuss the details of his plan. As January 1865 approached, Booth's plans reached a fever pitch. Booth purchased a new buggy and horse with Sam Arnold and Michael O'Laughlin driving them to Washington, D.C. Dave Harold acted as a guide for the other three as he knew the area around Maryland which proved useful for the kidnapping scenario. Harold had been receiving information from the Confederacy regarding the area and sat potentially ready for anything that would be thrown their way. Surratt and his mother tried to get him a leave of absence from his job, stating that his mother needed protection. The employer would hear nothing of it 
and Surratt simply walked away from the job without collecting his final paycheck. Booth also enlisted the help, most believe unknowingly, of Edward Ned Spangler. Over the last few years, Booth engaged Spangler in some various odd jobs and the two men knew each other well. Booth purchased a horse for $80 and requested that Spangler and another acquaintance fix the shack up as a stable behind Ford's Theater where the purchase of other horses could be kept until they were needed. Near Maryland was Port Tobacco, where Surratt made further arrangements involving the kidnapping plan. This port became known for its smuggling activity and Surratt purchased a large boat for approximately $250. Surratt also arranged that the boat be made ready for the night of the kidnapping so that the conspirators could cross the Potomac with the President of the United States in tow. It was there that Surratt enlisted the help of a local smuggler named George Azarat, whose services the conspirators would need later as they made their way to the Potomac River. When Surratt first approached the carriage painter, he stated to Azarat that they had some prisoners of war that they wanted to smuggle into Virginia. Azarat readily agreed, as the price was no concern to Surratt. Another person who would play an integral part in the conspiracy was a young private named Louis Thornton Powell, who had previously fought under the partisan rangers of Colonel John S. Mosby of the Confederate Army. Private Powell recently escorted two Union prisoners to Richmond, and after that, he put on civilian clothing and headed for Union lines. Turns out that the two Yankee lives that he saved did not sit well with the citizens of the Confederacy and he looked for something that could keep him occupied until the end of the war. Powell adopted the moniker of Louis Payne and signed an allegiance to the Union and therefore was granted permission to travel freely. Later, Payne became an agent for the Confederacy. The stage was finally set for the kidnapping of the country's chief executive. Certainly there were plots against this president all the time, but seeing an end in sight to the most destructive war in this nation's history, both in human and economic terms, President Lincoln's concentration became solely focused on how the South would be treated after the war. By February 1865, the plot was finalized and Booth finally met Atzerodt, the man who would ferry them to freedom and hopefully a new breath for the Confederacy. But something unexpected happened after Lincoln's inauguration on March 4, 1865, that changed the plan dramatically. But all it took was one of the conspirators to take a newly formed plan and carry it to its natural conclusion. For him, it was all or nothing after the kidnapping plot failed to materialize. On March 17, 1865, Booth received word from some of his theater friends that President Lincoln would be attending the play Still Waters Run Deep at the Campbell Soldiers Hospital. To Booth, the information seemed very reliable and Booth set about to kidnap the president on his way back to the White House after the play. At the time of the play, Booth learned that Lincoln never attended the performance. The chief executive was actually at the hotel where the actor was staying, receiving a captured Confederate combat flag. At the same time, Davy Harold visited the Surratt House in Surrattsville, where he played cards with some friends and waited to hear from Booth as to whether the abduction of the president had taken place. Not receiving any notice from Booth, at approximately 10 p.m. on March 17th, Harold gathered the weapons he stored at the Surratt House and proceeded to another location, the TB Tavern, approximately five miles from the Surratt House. He requested that the tavern owner store his weapons there, but the owner refused. Booth appeared frustrated with the plan that he so meticulously enabled with the people around him. Because of his stubbornness, Booth's plot to kidnap President Lincoln did not die instantly. The actor still held out that he could flawlessly execute the plan after a brief respite. Three days after the initial phase of the plot failed, Arnold and O'Laughlin checked out of their boarding houses and proceeded to Baltimore. Arnold wanted nothing to do with any further harebrained schemes to actually kidnap the president. However, 
O'Laughlin seemed intrigued with what Booth may plan next. He tacitly responded to Booth's summonses, and the remaining conspirators thought desperately to concoct another plot. John Surratt left a week after the plot failed, but Booth counted on Louis Payne, George Azeroth, and Harold, who remained involved with Booth, even if it meant to the bitter end. Fearing that his plans may have been upended and that authorities may have been on to him and the conspirators, Booth decided to appear in a play entitled The Apostate at Ford's Theater on March 18, 1865. This would be Booth's last performance on the stage. Ten days passed, and on March 27, 1865, Booth received word that the Lincolns purchased tickets to several plays that would take place at Ford's Theater. Booth wired O'Laughlin and then summoned Louis Payne to his hotel. On the 31st, Payne and O'Laughlin rode down to Washington, D.C. immediately at Booth's urging, but the president proved out of town for that whole week. Booth sounded a false alarm. On April 2nd, word spread that Richmond began an evacuation, fearing a Union invasion and then occupation. With this order, even if Booth kidnapped the president, he had nowhere to take him to await any ransom payment from the Union. Therefore, the Booth kidnapping plot died. On April 9, 1865, Booth received word that General Lee surrendered to General Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse. Booth became solitary and brooded over the loss. The actor believed that the South was not yet finished because many Confederate troops still remained in the field to continue the fighting. Also, there was still a chance that the remaining Confederate troops could take to the mountains and conduct a guerrilla war against the Union. This fear was not unfounded, but never really materialized. The next morning, feeling depressed and defeated, Booth informed a friend, Louis Weichmann, that he would never act again. But if someone produced a play entitled Venice Preserved, he would consider a return to the stage. The plot of the play concerned a man who sought to assassinate the entire cabinet of Venice due to their perceived tyranny over the citizens. Booth's carrying of the plot to the extreme may have had many motives, including, but not limited to, the mistreatment of the South as a defeated nation, believing that the Union would not grant the South the respect she deserved unless the Emperor had been executed and terms for reunion could be sternly dictated to the Union by a new Confederate government. Booth also feared with the ending of the war with a Union victory, Lincoln, like Julius Caesar, would become a dictator for life. At this point, the future seemed uncertain and gloomy for the South, and Booth endeavored to get back at the very man he blamed for the demise of the Confederacy. On April 11, 1865, Booth traveled to Boston in order to borrow more money and modify his plan. He contacted John Surratt in New York to let him know of the impending new plot. Booth wrote to Washington and instructed Ned Spangler to sell the buggy. Spangler wondered, then what will we transport the president in once the abduction had taken place? Spangler also tried to sell the horses, but no one wanted the large one who seemed to be blind in one eye. Booth's plan took on a more sinister objective as the other members of the conspiracy went about other missions as Booth sought to determine when the president would make a public appearance as the war was now over. He believed he could execute his plot to assassinate, rather than kidnap, the president of the United States. In addition to an attempted assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, Booth met with the conspirators and assigned them each a task that would totally decapitate the U.S. government. No opportunities presented themselves to the conspirators that day to assassinate President Lincoln, but with Booth's cajoling, Vice President Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State William H. Seward soon became the targets of the conspirators. George Azeroth was assigned to stay at the same hotel as Vice President Johnson, where he would engage the executive in a conversation regarding passes so that he and others would be able to travel to Richmond, Virginia. The objective of this confidence was twofold. Number one, if the kidnapping were still to occur, Booth and the other conspirators would need the passes with which to escape. And number two, 
If the plan changed, then Vice President Johnson could be associated with the conspirators. Booth had been notified by the manager of Ford's Theater that they sought to invite President Lincoln to their celebration commemorating the end of the war. Booth became very excited and alerted the other conspirators that on the 14th they would try again. As Azeroth was assigned to assassinate Vice President Johnson, Louis Payne would concentrate on William H. Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State. Payne began scouting around the Seward residence to see if certain patterns could be ascertained to properly execute the new plan. Payne flirted with the maid at the residence, Margaret Coleman, and checked on Seward's condition. A few days before, the secretary suffered serious injuries from a carriage accident and was considered immobile. What Payne wanted to ascertain was whether the secretary would just die on his own without being assassinated. Through Coleman, he learned that Seward was recovering slowly, so Payne would have to see which entrance he could breach in order to get to Seward. Later that day, on the 14th, Booth walked to a stable and then Ford's theater to check for his mail. Booth exchanged small talk with H. Clay Ford, the man who was running the theater that day. The conversation turned toward talk of the war. Booth stated that he did not appreciate the way General Lee surrendered, and Ford began to taunt Booth slightly. Then, Ford stated that President Lincoln and General Grant would be at the theater that night for a performance of Our American Cousin, a comedy starring actress Laura Keene. Booth left the theater after hearing this news and mounted his horse, making several circles around the theater to determine the best escape route. In the mid-afternoon, Ford and some of the stagehands decorated the president's box for the upcoming visit. Booth rode away from the theater and had several drinks at the Star Saloon with some of the stagehands from the theater. The stagehands suspected nothing, as they all knew and liked Booth. Booth went back to the theater and noticed a small hole in one of the doors to the box. Ford noticed the hole later, but did not make much of it at the time. Booth also cut a niche in the wall outside the door entrance so that the door could be closed despite any pressure from the outside. Booth then rode to the Surratt boarding house located at H Street and chatted with Mary Surratt. Knowing that Mrs. Surratt needed to go to the country to collect some money from a renter that she needed to pay off her own debt with another creditor, Booth gave Mrs. Surratt a package. It contained a pair of field glasses. When Mrs. Surratt arrived at the appointed location, she noticed that her renter was drunk, but she reminded him that the shooting irons that he possessed would be picked up later that evening. Later that afternoon, Booth learned that General Grant backed out at the last minute to his attendance at the play with the president. Mrs. Grant left Washington in order to visit the couple's children and he did not want to attend alone. Booth realized that without the general at his side, President Lincoln stood a chance to not be protected. Booth then went to the Kirkwood house where Vice President Johnson had been staying and left an incriminating note for the second in command, which stated, Didn't want to disturb you. Are you at home? J. Wilkes Booth. After leaving the Kirkwood, Booth ran into John Matthews, an actor within the Ford Stock Company. The conspirator handed Matthews a letter that he wanted delivered to the National Intelligencer to be published the following day. At approximately 8 p.m. that evening, on April 14, 1865, Booth met with Harold, Atzerodt, and Payne at the Herndon House for the last time. Atzerodt was having cold feet and became belligerent and stated to Booth that he did not join the conspiracy to kill anyone. He wished Booth success, but felt that he could not take part in such a sinister conspiracy. Atzerodt stated that Secretary Seward did not stand in line of succession to the presidency and could not understand why he should be targeted. It was not the succession that made Seward so controversial. It was his anti-slavery stance which constantly put him at odds with Southerners prior to secession. More than anything else, Seward sought power. But as an anti-slavery zealot, Booth maintained the importance of neutralizing Seward. Seward also held a special place within Booth's hatred, and he first suggested to the president the principle of arbitrary arrest, where the legal principle of habeas corpus was suspended in order to make sure that enemies of the state, by word or deed, would be arrested 
under an issue of national security. As Azarot was easily influenced, he accepted Booth's explanation and tacitly joined the conspiracy. At approximately 8.31 p.m. that evening, the orchestra struck the traditional anthem, Hail to the Chief, as President and Mrs. Lincoln took their seats in the presidential box located at stage right, slightly above the edge of the stage. The guests of the President and his wife that evening, Major Henry Rathbone and his fiancée, Miss Clara Harris, sat next to the couple in the presidential box. The valet for the evening, Charles Forbes, took a seat outside the door of the box. Officially, there were no guards present. At approximately 10 p.m., Booth rode his horse into the alley adjacent to Ford's Theater where he called for Ned Spangler to come out and hold his horse. Because Spangler had to work to do backstage at the performance, he could not abide with Booth's wishes. Therefore, he sent another stagehand, Joseph Peanuts Burroughs, to take care of Booth's horse. Booth then proceeded to the Star Saloon in order to ingest some liquid courage. Louis Payne waited in Lafayette Park because he, apparently, was supposed to gain entrance into Seward's residence by stating to whomever answered the door that he had a prescription for the ailing secretary from his physician, Dr. Tullio S. Verdi. A problem arose when Dr. Verdi had been at the Seward residence for some time, so Payne had to think about another ruse to get into the Seward residence in order to accomplish his mission. Meanwhile, at Ford's Theater, our American cousin entered its third act. By this time, Booth made his way from the tavern and entered the theater through the stage door. He walked up the stairs through the dress circle. Making his way toward the presidential box, Booth walked up to Charles Forbes and handed the valet his card. Forbes easily let him pass. Once Booth entered the small hallway outside of the presidential box, he barred the door between the box and the audience so that no one could enter during the completion of his mission. Within the small hallway, two doors stood between Booth and his target. The conspirator looked through the hole in one of the doors to make sure that the president actually made it to the performance. He acknowledged that his target lay just behind the second door. During this time in theater history, the house lights remained on during the performance so people could actually see Booth standing within the president's box during the play. Booth removed the small Derringer firearm and long hunting knife from his coat pockets as he crept into the presidential box. At this particular point in the play, one of the female characters, a Mrs. Mount Chessington, portrayed by actress Helen Moosey, accused the male character, portrayed by Asa Trenchard, that he had no manners. Mrs. Mount Chessington and her daughter, according to the script, walked off the stage and left Trenchard alone where he turned to the audience and stated, Don't know the manners of good society, eh? Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal, you sock dologizing old man trap. As Trenchard made the statement, as if on cue, Booth aimed his pistol at the back of Lincoln's head and pulled the trigger. A pistol shot rang throughout the theater. Some of the audience believed that the sound played a part in the performance. Major Rathbone reacted to the shot and went after the intruder who then slashed the Major's arm all the way to the bone with his knife. The audience heard the scuffle and then saw a man leap over the edge of the balcony connected to the front of the presidential box. Booth leapt from the box to the stage and landed off balance. He then put his hand in the air holding the knife and shouted, Sick Semper Tyrannis, the state motto of Virginia. Booth quickly limped his way to the stage door, mounted his horse, and galloped away from the theater in the dark of night. A woman screamed as a gaggle of people attempted to get into the president's box, but because Booth had placed a thick wooden bar so that no one could enter easily from the outside, it was increasingly difficult. Major Rathbone, badly wounded and bleeding, managed to remove the bar so that people could enter. No less than five doctors entered the box to examine the president of any wounds. The doctors virtually ignored Major Rathbone as he bled all over the floor. At the Seward residence, Dr. Verdi left his patient, Secretary Seward, when Louis Payne rang the doorbell. 
With this excuse for being there shot down with the excuse of the presence of Dr. Verdi, after the physician departed the residence, when Payne tried to enter the residence after a servant answered the door, the servant refused to let Payne walk through the door. Frederick Seward, assistant to the secretary and the patient's son, heard the commotion downstairs and when he went to investigate, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Payne. The would-be assassin then leveled his pistol at the young Seward's head and pulled the trigger. The weapon misfired and Payne, panicking with what to do next, struck Frederick Seward in the head with the malfunctioning firearm, sending the man to the floor with a serious head wound. Payne then made his way to Charles Seward's bedroom and approached his intended victim with a reckless abandon. An army nurse, Private George Robinson, and Major Augustus Seward tried to put up a fight. But both men exhibited a lot of surprise at such a violent person who made it this far into the secretary's bedroom. Payne brandished his knife and when he made to the secretary's bedside, he began slashing wildly at the invalid. The attack on the secretary was estimated to have taken a minute. When Payne believed his intended victim to have succumbed to the wounds, he ran from the house and down the street, screaming at the top of his voice, I'm mad, I'm mad. When all told, Major Augustus Seward suffered seven severe knife wounds. Private Robinson suffered four stab wounds. Another man who happened on the scene, Emmerich Hansel, suffered a wound as Payne left the Seward residence. As for Frederick Seward, he sustained a severe skull fracture from the force of Payne's blow. Charles Seward proved very lucky indeed. Payne slashed at the secretary's jugular, but did not know that Seward wore a steel brace that protected the area of Payne's concentration. The device was specifically designed to immobilize Seward's jaw, which he broke in the carriage accident on April 5th. He suffered three serious cuts to his face, but survived. As for Atzerodt, he lost his courage at the last minute. Back at Ford's Theater, Dr. Charles Leal examined President Lincoln's wound and deemed it impossible for him to recover. Transporting the President back to the White House would be most dangerous, so they had to locate a bed close by to where his condition could be further assessed. Volunteers carried the unconscious president across the street to the Peterson House and placed him on a bed in the back room of the residence. Because of President Lincoln's height, six foot four, his body had to be placed diagonally across the bed, his head bleeding into the pillow. Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton, arrived soon thereafter and took control of the situation. At this point, Stanton began an investigation where he took statements from witnesses close to the event to determine the identity of the person or persons responsible for this terrible act. As President Lincoln lay in Peterson House barely clinging to life, John Wilkes Booth had a healthy head start ahead of his pursuers. Authorities strongly believed Booth pulled the trigger but knew nothing else. Provost Marshall sent a special detail over to the Kirkwood House to check in on Vice President Johnson. They learned from the bartender there that a suspicious man had been hanging around the hotel and even visited the floor where Johnson's room was situated. When the manager looked into the register, he identified the man as G.A. Atzerodt. When the marshals burst into the door to Atzerodt's room, they found a bowie knife, some embroidered handkerchiefs, and a bank book belonging to John Wilkes Booth. Over the last several months, as Booth and the other conspirators made numerous visits to buy horses and rent rooms, etc., investigating detectives learned a great deal from visiting the various stables and boarding houses around the city. Through this line of inquiry, investigators connected John Surratt to Booth. Davy Harold was chased to the Navy Yard Bridge after he failed to return a rented horse to Naylor's stable on E Street before 4.30 that afternoon. The stableman spotted Harold riding past the stable and gave chase. By this time, in the early morning hours of April 15, 1865, authorities had the names of David Harold, John Surratt, and George Azarat in their possession and established connections between them and Booth. This spelled some sort of conspiracy. Meanwhile, President Lincoln still clung to life, with his breathing becoming shallower as the minutes passed. When the guard at the Navy Bridge was questioned by the investigators, 
He stated that two people crossed the bridge that night and one of them he identified as Booth. General Christopher C. Auger, who spearheaded the investigation through his command, immediately ordered a squad of soldiers to rush to Booth's hotel and tear it to pieces looking for evidence and perhaps hints as to where Booth may be headed. When Lieutenant William Tyrell entered Booth's room and found a trunk that contained leg irons and handcuffs, he found a letter to an unknown addressee that outlined the assassination plot. As Lieutenant Tyrell and his squad located various items in Booth's room, President Lincoln's unconsciousness continued into its ninth hour when, finally, at 7.22 a.m. on April 15, 1865, the 16th President of the United States breathed his last. Sounds of heavy sobbing and crying could be heard coming from what was now considered the death room. As Secretary Stanton observed the President take his last breath, he muttered just above a whisper, and now he belongs to the ages. Even though President Lincoln's death may have proven marginally beneficial to the defeated Confederacy, news of his death was greeted with sorrow and outrage on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. It seemed as though Booth fought for the rights of the Confederacy. Many in that region actually condemned his cowardly act. However, in several other locations, certain individuals hailed the assassination of the country's leader. One senator, William Salisbury, a senator from Delaware, praised Booth's actions and dared the local marshal to arrest him for his advocacy. In other areas, people expressed satisfaction that the great emancipator fell victim to an assassin's bullet. But for the most part, the nation grieved and those that expressed an opposing view were either ostracized or killed outright. The Booth family expressed a great deal of shock that John Wilkes performed such a dastardly act. Edwin Booth, the assassin's brother, performed in New York that night and he supported Lincoln. By the time he received word that his brother had been identified as the assassin, Edwin Booth was preparing for a performance in Cincinnati, Ohio. A mob gathered outside of his hotel and threatened to lynch the actor. He hid out for a few days and then made his way to Philadelphia where the marshal then placed him under arrest. Edwin Booth had previously written a letter to his brother to give up the oil business and did not realize that John Wilkes used that phrase as some sort of code when communicating with the other conspirators. John Matthews, John Wilkes's friend, remembered the envelope that the actor handed him the day of the murder. He rushed to his hotel room and tore the letter open. What he read made him uneasy, to say the least. When Caesar had conquered the enemies of Rome and the power that was his menace to the liberties of the people, Brutus arose and slew him. The stroke of his dagger was guided by his love for Rome. It was the spirit and ambition of Caesar that Brutus struck at. Booth's letter quoted from the Shakespearean tragedy with the words that Brutus wanted Caesar to bleed for his tyranny. Booth concluded the letter by stating that he answered with Brutus. The pursuit for Booth took on a new sense of urgency as literally thousands of people looked for the assassin. Secretary Stanton offered a $100,000 reward for the capture of all the conspirators. This ensured that many false leads arose and the troopers following those leads proved very disorganized with their pursuit. In fact, soldiers looted many houses under the auspices of searching for the presidential assassin. Many of the soldiers also viewed the search for Booth as a vacation from the combat they experienced. After all, the fighting was over and they had nothing better to do at the time. As a result of the hysteria that accompanied the pursuit, Hundreds of people were arrested because they resembled the assassin. They were later released, but it seemed that investigators began to panic at not being able to pursue the murderer along with the other conspirators. The only real lead the pursuers thought trustworthy was from a Dr. Samuel Mudd. It seemed that Booth stopped at Dr. Mudd's house because the assassin suffered a broken leg after he jumped and landed on the stage after shooting the president. 
At approximately the same time on April 17, 1865, authorities went to Mary Surratt's boarding house and arrested her as one of the conspirators. As the authorities led Mrs. Surratt from the boarding house, none other than Louis Payne knocked on the door in an attempt to rescue her from the law. Payne related that Mrs. Surratt hired him to dig a ditch on her property. Mrs. Surratt claimed she never met the man before and the authorities placed little credence in his story. Payne was placed into custody as well and when the two suspects were brought to General Augur's headquarters, William Bell identified Payne as the man who broke into the Seward residence and attacked four people, including Secretary Seward. With President Lincoln deceased for the last two days and Vice President Johnson sworn in as the new president, officials in the government made plans for a state funeral. On the morning of April 18, 1865, President Lincoln's body lay in state in the East Room of the White House. Over 25,000 mourners made their way to the People's House to pay their respects to the fallen president. On April 19, dignitaries visited in order to attend a funeral service. The reverend officiating the services ended his eulogy with a call for vengeance in the death of President Lincoln. On April 20th, President Lincoln's remains lay in state again where an additional 25,000 mourners made their way past the catafalque holding his remains. On April 21st, pallbearers brought the body to the train station where the 16th President of the United States would make his way across the country to Springfield, Illinois, where his final resting place had been prepared. The trip would take 12 days. Lincoln's son, Willie Lincoln, who died in 1863, had been disinterred and made the trip along with his father back to Illinois. On the night of April 20th, six squad members from the 1st Delaware Cavalry arrested Azeroth at the home of his cousin, Hartman Richter, in the cousin's Montgomery County, Maryland home. When the detachment brought the conspirator back to Washington, D.C., he confessed, the first of many, as to his involvement in the plans and the way the plans were to unfold. Azeroth believed that by telling his side of the story, a court would go easy on him. He was wrong. On April 26, 1865, the master plotter and his accomplice sat in a barn at what became infamous as Garrett's Farm outside of Port Royal, Virginia. A detachment of the 16th New York Cavalry surrounded the barn after receiving a tip as to where Booth and Harold took as a hideout. Harold immediately surrendered, but Booth decided he would fight his way out. After trying to negotiate a surrender, Detective Edverton Conger became frustrated with the negotiations and lit fire to the barn. Booth still would not capitulate. When Booth tried to make a dash for the door to the barn on crutches and with his broken leg, one member of the Army Detachment, Sergeant Boston Corbett, a religious zealot who at one time castrated himself in order to resist any carnal temptations, peered through one of the holes in the walls of the barn. He leveled his cavalry revolver and fired one shot into the barn, striking Booth in the neck and severing his spine. As the fire raged, several soldiers from the 16th New York Cavalry retrieved Booth's limp body, even though he was still alive. The soldiers brought the assassin to the porch of the Garrett house. His breathing became labored and he requested that he be shown his hands. When one of the soldiers lifted Booth's hands to in front of his face to view them, Booth was heard to whisper, useless. He died two hours later. The conspirators sat in the old Capitol prison until federal authorities could decide whom to charge in the conspiracy and the assassination. Eventually, at the end of April, George Azarot, David Harold, Louis Payne, Powell, Michael O'Laughlin, Samuel Arnold, Edmund Spangler, Dr. Samuel Mudd, and Mary Surratt were charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Jefferson Davis and some other leaders from the Confederacy would be tried in absentia as they were on the run. John Surratt got away at the last minute and remained out of the country as when the trial started, his mother would fight for her life. On April 29, 1865, guards transferred the defendants to the Washington Arsenal Penitentiary. Mary Surratt joined her fellow conspirators a little later with Dr. Mudd 
added to the list as well. President Andrew Johnson ordered the defendants tried in a military tribunal where rules and findings were beyond the reach of the Supreme Court. Because most of the Confederate units had not surrendered by April 14th, the night of the assassination, the military exerted its jurisdiction over the trials as the assassination occurred during wartime and within the Union lines. The trial of the conspirators occurred from May 10th to June 30th, 1865, with over 491 people subpoenaed to the tribunal to testify. Only 343 actually gave testimony. On the last day, the jury reached its verdict. Arnold, O'Laughlin, and Dr. Mudd were found guilty of conspiracy and sentenced to life imprisonment. Ned Spangler was found innocent in the conspiracy, but the jury found him guilty in assisting with Booth's escape, sentencing him to six years in prison. Azarot, Payne, Harold were all found guilty and sentenced to die by hanging. Mary Surratt was found guilty of the assassination, but five of the jury members recommended clemency because she was a woman. President Johnson denied any clemency and then sentenced the four to hang for their convictions. The prisoners learned that on July 6th that the court would carry out their sentences on the following day. The military tribunal tried John Surratt in absentia and after several stops in the United States and then Canada, he was finally captured in Egypt. On July 7, 1865, the four conspirators were led to the gallows constructed outside of the courtroom. Authorities hanged all four together. They hanged there for a short time and then the bodies were cut down. The government did not return the bodies of the executed to their families until February of 1869. Harold was buried in the Congressional Cemetery near the Navy Yard. Azarot was first buried in a temporary cemetery and then moved to St. Paul Cemetery in Druid Hill, Baltimore, Maryland. Payne, or Powell's body, was lost. His father, a Presbyterian minister, made the trip from Florida to retrieve his son's body. During the return trip, the father became very ill and likely buried his son somewhere in the Carolinas. And Mary Surratt lies next to her daughter in Washington's Mount Olivet Cemetery. Her grave is marked with a simple tombstone. The master planner, John Wilkes Booth, was identified during an autopsy that took place on the U.S. Navy ship Montauk. The remains had been placed in a funeral parlor in Baltimore for family and close friend viewing, then buried in the Booth lot at Green Mount Cemetery. Michael O'Laughlin died at Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas in September 1867, one of the victims of the yellow fever epidemic there. Dr. Samuel Mudd distinguished himself with his crisis when he saved a lot of patients and comforted the dying. In February 1869, President Johnson pardoned Dr. Mudd, but his family has fought since to clear his name. After all, Dr. Mudd merely repaired the broken leg of a man he barely met. Then finally, in 1977, President Jimmy Carter acknowledged Dr. Mudd's innocence, but since President Andrew Johnson already pardoned him, there was nothing more that President Carter could do. When John Surratt finally returned to the United States after the assassination, he stood trial. But since it had been a long time since the assassination and the feeling of the country had changed upon his return, he was never convicted as a conspirator in President Lincoln's murder. As with most tragic events in American history, myths began the moment that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. The first myth was that the Confederacy actually engaged Booth to assassinate President Lincoln. This plot may be historically viewed as just one explanation as to why the conspiracy appeared so vast at first. There is no documentation to support this conclusion. One of the other conspiracy theories that surfaced after the assassination and trial of the conspirators stated that Andrew Johnson may have engaged Booth to assassinate the president. This accusation 
occurred during a time when President Johnson fought off his political enemies who tried to impeach him for allegedly violating a law against firing people without the military's approval. The impeachment ultimately failed. Another conspiracy that surfaced regarded the Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton. Secretary Stanton and the radical Republicans despised President Lincoln's policies toward the South and took advantage of his death to institute a reign of terror and substitute his programs. It is alleged that Secretary Stanton enlisted the assistance of the National Detective Police under the command of Lafayette Baker with some other radicals that plotted President Lincoln's death in order to further their Reconstruction agenda. The military trial took place in order to silence the conspirators as to the assassination plan and who may have engaged the conspirators in the first place. For years after the assassination, some historians and assassination scholars believed that John Wilkes Booth actually escaped from Garrett's farm and an imposter was autopsied. This theory has gained momentum in the past few years with stories of eyewitness accounts that have surfaced over the last 100 years. This theory adheres to the belief that someone else died in his place and the government realized that Booth was still alive at the time and those in the government proceeded with the cover-up so that their complicity would not be exposed. There had been rumors as to Booth's last resting place as allegedly the U.S. government buried Booth's body at the United States arsenal when gossip stated that his body had been dumped into the Potomac River. The persistence of this theory occurred when a lawyer named Finney L. Bates wrote a book entitled The Escape and Suicide of John Wilkes Booth, where the author claimed that he knew a man named John St. Helen, whom Bates stated he was present when St. Helen actually made a deathbed confession that he was John Wilkes Booth. But then St. Helen made a full recovery, and the two men never saw each other again. Later, in 1903, in Enid, Oklahoma, a sign painter named David E. George committed suicide. After his death, local newspapers claimed that George made statements that he was John Wilkes Booth, and when Bates went to Enid, he identified George's body as that of John St. Helen. In essence, Booth equaled St. Helen equaled George. For a few years after George's death, Bates took the man's remains on the road and marketed them as the mummified remains through carnivals and sideshows as that of John Wilkes Booth. The mummy had been subject to various examinations and later x-rays, but still no conclusive proof had been gathered that the mummy was actually John Wilkes Booth. The mummified remains eventually disappeared in the 1970s and have not been seen since. Chances are that conspiracy theorists place credence in the various escape stories. However, one fact remains. The 16th President of the United States, known as the Great Emancipator, was assassinated on April 14, 1865, and forever changed the course of a nation's healing. Now, if you like this presentation, please check out our other offerings and hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified of future presentations. Until next time.